welcome back uh, or good evening for those of you that are returning uh, to our last webinar of 2022. And uh, if you've been with us, this is the Canadian Concussion Centers webinar series, which is sponsored by the Labor's International Union of North America, LAUNA. Uh, my name is Leslie Rattan, and I'm really pleased to be moderating uh, the series, which was developed uh, for individuals that have suffered a concussion, their caregivers and healthcare providers. The sessions, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, are all recorded and available on the Canadian Concussion Center website. So if there's anything that you've missed, uh, you're always able to go back and, uh, and view it there. During tonight's session, if you do have any questions, uh, we would welcome you to uh, type those into the Q&A. If you scroll to the, just to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A. So please enter any questions there. Uh, that you have for our speaker. And uh, you'll also see under the chat uh, function um, that uh, Christian has very kindly uh, put the post in there that has the previous recordings if you want to, um, if you want to uh, go to that uh, right now. If you have any technical difficulties, you can also enter those into the chat and Christian will, uh, will give you a hand. Uh, so before we move on, we're just going to run a quick poll, and we're doing this uh, each webinar just to get a sense of who is in our audience, which helps us for planning uh, for future uh, sessions. So you should see that on your screen, and if you can just uh, answer that, we'll give you a second. And great, thank you. So for this evening's session, I'm really pleased to welcome back Dr. Marie Slager, uh, who's going to be talking to us about headaches uh, in concussion. And Dr. Slager obtained her medical degree and completed her residency in internal medicine at the University of Ottawa. She then trained in neurology at McGill University. She formerly was on active staff at Centenary Health Center in Scarborough for several years and now has a solo adult neurology community practice with a focus on headache me medicine. So I'm really pleased to uh, have Dr. Slager back with us. So I'm gonna turn it over to her now. Thanks very much, Leslie. That's a lovely introduction. I'm really pleased to be back uh, to talk about one of my favorite topics, headache, and um, in, in the context of concussion. Um, okay, let's see, technical. So I just uh, have my disclosures up there just for your information. So I guess we need some definitions. And so we look to the International Classification of Headache Disorders, third edition, and a headache in the context of concussion would be a headache attributed to trauma or injury to the head and or neck. So we, we sort of more loosely call it post-concussion headache. It's among the most common of the secondary headache disorders. Um, we call it acute if it occurs, um, uh, if, it, if it is occurring up to three months after the injury, but persistent if lasting longer than three months after the injury. And many of us will be seeing the patients that are lasting longer than the three months because uh, by the time they get to us, uh, things are just persisting and they need some interventions. Um, there's actually no known specific headache features to uh, distinguish uh, the types of headache attributed to trauma. And um, so we sort of look at our other primary headache disorders. Primary headache refers to um, you know, headaches that have no underlying cause, uh, such as head injury or say brain tumor, that type of thing. So, but most, most of the time in the concussion world, we're seeing headaches that resemble migraine or tension type headache. What are some risk factors for post-concussion headache? Certainly a prior headache history, particularly, uh, well, migraine and tension type headache. Um, it's actually associated with less severe injuries, surprisingly. So these patients that have had um, more severe injuries that require, that cause uh, brain hemorrhages or skull fracture actually don't necessarily have persisting headache like the concussion group. Female gender is a risk factor and uh, the presence of other comorbidities, uh, particularly psychiatric ones, depression and anxiety. So post-concussion headache may occur as a single isolated symptom. 
following trauma, but more commonly, we see a whole constellation of symptoms. And um, many people in our audience will be familiar with this, that not only is there just headache, but dizziness, fatigue, cognitive problems, including reduced concentration, memory problems, uh, sleep disturbances, particularly insomnia, anxiety, irritability, psychomotor slowing, which is really a manifestation of depression. And if there are several of these symptoms occurring, we call them persisting post-concussion symptoms. Um, I think we need to look at the definition of migraine because I just said that concussion headaches often have features of these primary headache disorder like migraine. So in the international headache uh, classification, uh, the definition is at least five attacks in someone's life, fulfilling criteria B through D. So B is headache attacks that last at least four hours and often many more hours than that, untreated or unsuccessfully treated. Obviously, acute uh, painkillers may uh, shorten the duration. Um, headache with at least two of the following features, unilateral location, that means one-sided headache, pulsating quality, like a throbbing quality. It doesn't have to be always throbbing, but sometimes you know the feature will exhibit this, this kind of quality. Moderate or severe pain intensity um, and aggravation by or um, causing avoidance of just simple physical activities such as walking or climbing stairs. And during the headache, at least one of the following, nausea and or vomiting, photophobia and phonophobia. Photophobia is light sensitivity, phonophobia is noise sensitivity. And these are often features that the people in the concussion group will um, describe. And of course, not better accounted by any other uh, international classification of headache disorder diagnosis. Um, Migraine prevalence is very high. Uh, it's estimated up to 18% of women and 6% of men have this. Um, so, uh, you know, and it should be inquired about when evaluating a concussion patient. Um, migraine is most active, most uh, prevalent uh, during young adulthood and midlife. And that's manifesting here between the ages of 18 and 44. And then there's tension type headache. It's not as well defined in my opinion, but it's typically considered to be bilateral. That means both sides of the head involved, non-throbbing, could be mild to moderate intensity, um, and typically without other associated features like the light and noise sensitivity, nausea, et cetera. Um, there's also this persistent headache attributable to whiplash. So uh, this would be a headache that is, has been associated with a whiplash type injury um, that's associated with neck pain and or a headache. And the headache developed within seven days after the whiplash. Headache persists more than three months after the onset and not better accounted for by any other um, international classification of headache disorder diagnosis. Um, treatment. So this is, I guess, the, the really important thing that many of the people in the audience are going to be interested in. And the, the, the unfortunate thing is that there's lack of research on treatment for post-concussion headache as such. So we're actually left uh, a little bit in uh, using what are tools that we have in our other areas of headache treatment and headache work. Um, so treatment is directed by the headache description. Um, and so if it has migraine features, then we are going to uh, treat it the way we treat migraine patients. Um, so first we start with lifestyle. Um, these are absolutely essential. I view them as the foundation of headache management. Um, and so we look at sleep. Uh, of course, sleep may be disturbed, as I already mentioned, um, in the post-concussion um, headache patient. But we, we talk to patients about trying to get uh, good quality sleep, um, enough sleep every night. So this is um, enhanced by good sleep hygiene, which means get into a good sleep routine, prepare oneself for going to sleep, which means turning off devices two or three hours before sleep so that the bright screens don't disturb that natural progression towards relaxation um, and getting drowsy and then being able to fall asleep. Don't do activating activities before sleep, do relax relaxing activities. Um, 
The other thing is if one is awake, uh, awakened in the middle of the night and it's hard to fall back to sleep, don't uh, start looking at your screen, watching television, reading, looking at your phone, scrolling on the internet. That's about the worst thing to do. It's much better to perhaps, um, you know, use a soft light, maybe read something uh, boring, not activating, not something scary or, or exciting, and see if you can uh, feel, uh, you know, sleepy again, drowsy again, and get back to sleep. And try to keep the same routine. Even if you had a really bad night, get up at the same time in the morning. And then that segues into the next uh, lifestyle, which is eating habits. We really recommend three regular meals, including a good breakfast within one hour of getting up in the morning with some protein. Why do we say that? A hungry brain is more likely to be pushed into headache mode than a well-fed brain. So we, we don't want to keep the brain um, in a low energy mode, which tends to trigger headache. Um, the protein is um, giving you a source of energy that's going to last to the next meal instead of a quick a uh, burst of energy that you might get with a glass of orange juice, which is going to have you running on empty again within an hour. Hydration. It's very important to uh, get enough fluids, preferably plain water or, you know, the sort of equivalent like herbal teas, for instance, but not caffeinated. OK, and so that you're not uh, promoting more headache with uh, dehydration. Of course, water is like everything else. Not too much, not too little. Find the sweet spot because some people actually overhydrate. And the way you know you're overhydrating is if you're running to the washroom very frequently and avoiding large amounts. Um, so you want to find sort of a, a, you know, a middle ground on that. Caffeine intake. Excess caffeine is associated with aggravating headache. And so I usually tell patients, don't uh, consume more than two sort of regular sized coffees per day to avoid overuse of caffeine. Um, so if, if one is exceeding that, I dial it back. And of course, uh, probably do it a little bit gradually because sudden changes in caffeine intake can actually induce a headache. Um, the other thing about caffeine is timing during the day. I recommend not having it afternoon because it has a long duration of action in the body and may affect nighttime sleep. So that's another, you know, um, component of caffeine. Exercise. Can't emphasize enough how important exercise is in general health maintenance, but for brain health maintenance. And in the concussion group, it's quite important to, to move your body. You may not be able to do as high intensity exercise as you were doing before that, but whatever you can you can incorporate um, is important. And you, you exercise to just below the level, which might worsen your headache, but it's very important to do this. And minimum is 30 minutes a day. It can be brisk walking. It doesn't have to be you know, an actual gym or trainer or whatever. Um, and, but it's important not to uh, avoid exercise. Stress management. This is important. Um, stress management can in, in, encompass a, a variety of things, things you do yourself. I mean, people are, you know, are probably more aware now of things like meditation, mindfulness, which there are resources out there, online books, that you can learn these skills on your own. Uh, if one has the advantage and um, you know privilege of having a, perhaps a therapist, they sometimes can also work on things like cognitive behavioral therapy, but not everyone has access to that. Um, the other thing is yoga. Yoga combines both um, sort of a meditative uh, you know, component, mental component, along with the exercise component. So I think that that's actually a very good uh, way to combine the two exercise and um, stress management. And then remember uh, medication overuse of uh, pain medications. There's a real tendency if you have daily headache to be tempted to take your over-the-counter medication, uh, which generally people for instance, the pharmacist won't say anything if you're buying large bottles of it and you go through these bottles very quickly because you're using it every day because you have daily headache. Refrain from doing that. It might make your headaches worse, not to mention the ill effects on the rest of your body, such as your stomach, which you could get irritated stomach, stomach bleeding ulcers from uh, certain kinds of drugs and your liver and kidneys. Okay, so here is, a, once again, this medication overuse. There's actually a definition for this. So if you have headache 15 days or more per month, 
using uh, painkillers, uh, depending which painkiller, 15 days or more per month for simple painkillers, uh, for three months, you actually qualify or you, you satisfy the criteria to be called medication overuse headaches. So you don't want to uh, aggravate the headache problem even more by doing this. And then prescription drugs, um, uh, it may be a lower threshold to cause it. And so we say don't use it more than uh, nine to 10 days a month. Uh, for instance, medications for migraine that are acute painkillers like triptans or combination prescription drugs or opioids. Um, so here's the acute pain medication, simple analgesics, uh, which are non-prescription, acetaminophen, non steroidal anti-inflammatories that one can usually purchase over the counter like ibuprofen and naproxen. The prescription uh, I mentioned triptans. Triptans are migraine specific painkillers, which we do use in this context if there's migraine features. Um, but again, the threshold to develop uh, uh, medication overuse headache is a bit lower with triptans, so don't exceed nine days a month. And then there's prescription non steroidal anti inflammatories, which are usually similar to what's bought over the counter, but at higher doses. And we do tend to discourage use of opioids. Uh, it's felt that these may, they have a lot of problems, obviously, which is in the news every day, addiction potential, uh, other side effects like um, constipation, et cetera, but also may worsen your headaches. So you don't want to go there. And then the combination prescription analgesics, which often contain opioid, caffeine, and acetaminophen, for instance, um, you want to avoid those as well. So we stay away from those in this context. Um, so I guess, I guess, you know, I've discussed this already. Uh, the one point is we have to be working on trying to get you to have fewer headaches. So we want to reduce the headache burden. And this is the next part, prescription preventive medications. Um, these are medications primarily used daily to reduce the frequency, severity of the headaches, and to decrease disability. That's the name of the game here, to keep you from being uh, disabled by your headaches that you're unable or uh, unable to function such as work, school, um, your home life, you know, childcare or taking care of your family um, and social, your social life. Um, so that's what our aim is. Uh, I wish I could say we have drugs that are, or treatments that are going to abolish, but I could never say that because it's an unrealistic aim. We we're trying to reduce, if we can, reduce frequency and severity and disability. Um, so um, preventive medication. Well, in, in migraine, we have the non-prescription uh, supplements, uh, riboflavin, which is actually vitamin B, like baby two, and the dose in migraine is 400 milligram a day. They're usually sold as 100 milligram tablets. They're bright yellow pills. You take four a day. Mostly patients tolerate these very, that very well. Magnesium, same dose, 400 milligram a day. Magnesium is sold usually as a compound of something, magnesium, citrate, magnesium, glycinate, et cetera. And it doesn't really matter which one you choose, although magnesium citrate and maybe magnesium biglycinate or glycinate are better tolerated, but there are other forms of magnesium that would be equally acceptable. Um, the one thing about magnesium, it's always been used as a laxative. One of the side effects, if you're taking too much for your system is um, loose bowel movement. So if that happens, it's not that you can't take magnesium at all. You just need a smaller dose. And sometimes people have to fiddle around to get the dose that's okay for them. Some people feel magnesium is helpful for sleep. Anyway, I tell patients to take it at bedtime, so it may have a dual purpose. And then there's coenzyme Q10. And the dose uh, that's in the literature is 150 milligram a day. Sometimes that's hard to find. Uh, if it's 200 milligram that's on the shelf, that's what I tell patients to obtain. Now, keeping in mind, this is for migraine, but as I said, we translate our treatments to the concussion uh, patients if they have migraine features. And then there's the prescription. And so we have the first line preventives, um, which consist of a lot of pretty old drugs that we have discovered over 
many years of use and are in the headache guidelines uh, for migraine. Um, and they're sort of repurposed. They were not invented for migraine or headache. Uh, so the tricyclic antidepressants, which are an old you know, version of antidepressants that used to be used, rarely used now for depression, but we still use in pain management and headache, amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Um, these drugs uh, can be sedating, which sometimes is a benefit because it's a side effect that if somebody has insomnia uh, could be helpful dry mouth and weight gain are some other side effects, unfortunately. Uh, beta blockers, which are heart drugs and, and antihypertensive, meaning for blood pressure. So we have propranolol and natalol as examples. And um, uh, these drugs may cause fatigue, or uh, shouldn't be used in patients with asthma. Um, Anti-epilepsy drugs, surprisingly, to perhaps uh, people in the audience can be used. And uh, so topiramate and gabapentin are examples. Uh, topiramate actually was released on the market a couple of decades ago, I guess, uh, for epilepsy. And then they actually did a proper clinical, some clinical trials and showed that it's useful as a migraine preventive. So it's actually labeled for that use, unlike most of the other things that are on this screen that are not labeled for this use. Um, so that's one of its good points. It never causes weight gain, another good point. Uh, but there are some potential side effects, tingling of the extremities. Um, some patients get cognitive side effects, which can be quite problematic. And that is a, often, a, a, if patients uh, get that, they will discontinue it. And so I use it cautiously in the concussion group because patients often have that symptom already. Gabapentin um, for some patients is quite useful uh, because it's again sedating. So that helps the patients with insomnia, but dry mouth and weight gain are potential side effects. Antihypertensive, a blood pressure drug called candesartan, really a good drug. Um, although it's really for high, high blood pressure, it works not too badly in headache. And I like it because of its side effect profile, which is that most patients tolerate it really well, even if they have normal blood pressure. Um, so no weight gain, no sedation, um, no cognitive problems. So it's, a, it's quite a good drug and it works for a lot of patients. Um, and then we have the, uh, the newer generation antidepressants, SSRI, SNRIs, like venlafaxine and duloxetine. Um, okay, so how do I select the first line preventive? Like the first time I go through this with people, I look at people's comorbidities and this sort of alluded to that before, but if a patient has insomnia, I'm gonna choose one of the sedating drugs, amitriptyline, gabapentin. If there's depression, I'm gonna look at, well, maybe we should think about venlafaxine, duloxetine. I mean, amitriptyline at the doses we use is probably not high enough to really significantly treat depression, but um, it won't be sort of harmful probably. And it's, it, do, it does uh, have a calming effect for some people. So that sometimes is, is good if there's some anxiety. Um, if people have a weight problem, meaning they're overweight, then I look at topiramate and candesartan, which are uh, at least weight neutral. Candesartan is weight neutral. Topiramate can be weight neutral. And there's the a certain percentage of people that sometimes lose weight on it. The reason is because it suppresses appetite. Asthma, uh, I don't give beta blockers. I sort of mentioned that. Okay, preventive treatment. What are principles of treatment? We start slowly, gradually increase to the target dose, ensure an adequate trial, high enough dose, adequate duration, which that, that means two or three months. Adequate dose depends on the drug and the patient's tolerability and side effects, which I've talked about, really vary according to which drug because they're all from different drug classes. What to try next if first lines fail? Botulinum toxin, uh, we sometimes use. It is an off-label use. I mean, botulinum toxin is for chronic migraine, not for post-concussion headache, but if we make a case that the patient probably had migraine before, which I always ask, you know, was there ever any headaches in the past before you hit your head? Um, it, you know, we can make a case for considering botulinum toxin. And um, chronic migraine is defined as headache 15 days or more per month for three months with at least eight days with migraine features. Many of our, our concussion patients satisfy that kind of at least frequency of headache. 
Uh, what are advantages? It's safe, very favorable side effect profile. You don't get mood changes, weight gain, dry mouth, or sleepiness, and quite good efficacy for a lot of patients, not everybody. Disadvantages, cost. Private insurance often will pay for it if we satisfy their criteria, which is, well, they buck chronic headache and tried a few of the first line drugs. It requires a trained practitioner for administration and they are injections, which some people are not too crazy about. Um, new treatments. There are new drugs for migraine. They're called the CGRP um, monoclonal antibodies. CGRP is calcitonin gene related peptide. The first one that came in uh, Canada was late 2018. And now we actually have four of them. And um, so, you know, will this be useful in our concussion patients? Perhaps. But again, we don't have uh, research that backs up their use in, you know, this post-concussion kind of headache. Um, so the conclusion of, of my talk today is that, well, really post-concussion headache management is challenging. Um, I'm always up for the challenge, but it is challenging. And um, so often we have to try a number of things. Um, the approach includes a careful history to identify headache features. And so I spent a lot of time exploring that with patients. We need to do a complete evaluation to include comorbidities. We really need to know our patients. What other issues do they have, uh, including you know, depression, anxiety, um, et cetera. And a holistic approach is required to successfully manage these difficult headaches. Um, so I, I do look at lifestyle and I emphasize the importance of it. It's not just about prescribing medicines, but a whole you know, a holistic approach. And I really think we need more research to help guide our treatments and do better. Um, take home points. Well, do maintain a healthy lifestyle with all the things I've talked about, sleep, eating, fluids, etc. Consider a preventive medication. Many patients are reluctant to go on a daily medication. I mean, it's not forever. It's to see if we can get these headaches under better control. And if, if they become better controlled and in remission, then we can withdraw the drug eventually. Practice stress management. Don't forget exercise. It's very, you know, I think exercise really has so many benefits. And then treat comorbidities like depression and anxiety. And don't overuse pain medication. Don't overuse caffeine. And I guess thank you very much for your attention and, and having me again on the webinar series. And uh, that's the end. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Slager. That was excellent. And uh, that leaves us with a lot of time for questions. So if I, there's a number of questions in there already, but if you uh, want to get yours answered, please enter those into the, uh, the Q&A. So our first question is, what kind of exercises are helpful for concussion headache? Oh, I think you're muted, Dr. Slager. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, I think uh, aerobic exercise is probably the best. So what's aerobic exercise? It means you're using oxygen. And um, that would be exercises that get your heart rate up from resting and you have to breathe more quickly and deeply. So fast walking, for instance, is an example. I mean, it could be more vigorous than that if you can tolerate it, like jogging, running, cycling, stationary bike, you know, some people might like swimming if you're swimming at a decent pace, like lengths. Um, that's the kind of thing I think is most beneficial for, for brain health. And, um, you know, if, if, if the, vi the vigorous exercise triggers more headache or worsens your headache, then you would dial it down. But just to below threshold of where it um, worsens your headache. Great, thank you. Uh, we have someone else saying they've never had a migraine in their life prior to their concussion that changed everything six years ago. Uh, but I'd really like to understand why do they develop? What happens in the brain, specifically the sensation that I describe as cramping in the brain or like muscle zapping or spasming? <laughs> wow, that's a tough one. Um... I'm not sure we know. And this is very hard to study. Um, and in fact, you know, even the primary headache disorders, we don't, we don't totally understand why people have migraine. I mean, we think there's a genetic thing going on. Um, 
and there's sort of a pain circuit that these like sort of at least a, a model of a pain circuit that causes headache. But then if you have an acquired headache disorder, uh, which is like a headache secondary to the head injury, um, where is that coming from? I don't think we actually understand that. That would be something that, you know, I think people are researching it, but I don't think people really understand that in the, you know, in the science world. So I wish I could answer, but <laughs> now yeah. the other thing is that sometimes with careful questioning, I uncover that somebody is a little more prone to a primary headache disorder like migraine than they thought, because I find out that there's a family history of migraine or they had um, what we call uh, migraine equivalents. What does that mean? These are symptoms that actually are fit with migraine and, and they often occur in childhood before migraine actually starts happening at like the typical age is puberty or young adulthood. But people who have motion sickness, people who have uh, recurrent stomach aches when they were little children, which, you know, you know, I ask them, did you have that? And they say, oh yeah, I used to, I used to miss school. And did you go to the doctor? Oh yeah, and they didn't know what was wrong with me. And, you know, there is this entity called abdominal migraine that the pediatric neurologist will diagnose. And I mean, you know, migraine is who you are throughout your life, but it may have different manifestations through the lifespan. Um, so these are things that I ask patients because sometimes it's a clue that there's more migraine tendency than they thought. The other one is sleepwalking is linked. Childhood sleepwalking is linked to migraine in adulthood. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, some patients have reported that aromatherapy is helpful, helpful for concussion headaches. What is your opinion on this? It, really interesting. Um, I, you know, I haven't actually heard that myself. I, I, I think that it's fine to do it if you feel it's helpful. Um, some people, when they have headache, they are more sensitive to smells and it may bother them and increase their headache. So I think it's a, an individual thing. If you feel it's useful, uh, sure, by all means do it. But um, it's not something that is probably, you know, in the scientific literature as a treatment or whatever. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, someone is asking, are there any contraindications to the use of triptans? People who have known or suspected heart disease should not be prescribed triptans. And so, uh, you know, we sort of younger people are, unless they've been identified by their doctors to have some kind of heart problem, um, they're generally... Um, we don't worry about it unless patient says, oh, I, I have a heart, I have heart disease. Um, we worry a little more in an older individual, um, particularly if they have vascular risk factors. So vascular risk factors are high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking history, um, um, you know, having, if they've ever had a stroke, for instance, that's another, because it's, you know, vascular disease is in the brain and in the heart. So either either one of those would be a, a red flag for using triptans. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next question. So are you saying that taking Tylenol every day can give you a rebound headache or worsen your headaches? Yes, <laughs> that's the idea. Yeah, so in the headache world, no matter what causes your headache, we discourage that kind of um, use of, of daily uh, analgesics or painkillers because of that risk. Great, thank you. What category of medications would you recommend for a primary care doctor to prescribe to a patient with symptoms suggestive of post-concussion headache? When should that practitioner refer the patient to a neurologist for further management of this type of headache? Okay, so it was the, the first part was analgesics, right? So yeah, what category of medications yeah. would you recommend for the doctor yeah. to prescribe? Um, you know, I think that uh, if there are migraine features, definitely use triptans. Um, many patients will have tried something themselves, right? They'll 
have purchased and used uh, simple, you know, acetaminophen or ibuprofen. And, you know, if those have failed, then, you know, triptans would be a reasonable option if there's migraine features, like they say, they have photo light sensitivity or, you know, noise sensitivity or et cetera, as I mentioned in my, my slides. Um, you know, a prescription non sterile anti inflammatory could also be used because, you know, patients may have tried, you know, a sort of lower dose non sterile anti inflammatory they can buy over the counter, but the stronger one might be more effective. So a prescription uh, non sterile anti inflammatory, but I would really stay away from opioids, uh, whether, you know, the weak opioids like codeine and things like that, uh, or the stronger ones, which sometimes people will you know, get into the using the oxycodone and, and maybe even more potent stuff, I would stay away from those right away. Um, when do you refer on? Well, if the, you know, the majority of people with a concussion, um, they will have a short duration of symptoms. Of course, we see the people that don't get better. So we kind of feel like there's everybody has a problem with concussion and it never gets better. But the patients who don't resolve, um, say within three months, spontaneously with just sort of, you know, um, watchful waiting, uh, probably uh, refer on to neurology. I mean, you know, a family physician can also consider prescribing the preventive and get the, get the ball rolling um, because it does take a while for those to work. And um, it, if you're waiting, you know, sometimes specialist wait times are long and uh, you want to, you want to get something going, you know, while awaiting the, the specialist. But I think, I think we have to treat patients a bit, you know, not wait till it's been three years and they've had a daily headache We'd like to treat them earlier in the phase because perhaps, you know, as it becomes more and more chronic, it's harder to treat. It's harder to reverse this. So I think uh, I would advocate for earlier uh, management with the preventives. If, you know, this thing seems to be, you know, just going uh, beyond like three months or more. Okay, great. Thank you. And on that note, if you have been through a variety of the drugs with no effect, still are having daily headaches, what would the next step be? Well, it's kind of what I, I showed on my slide. So we have we have quite a long, you know, a list of all these different, you know, first line drugs. Um, we we sometimes go through those very quickly because of tolerability. So you know. Or we, or we have contraindications, which means, you know, we can't prescribe a certain class of drug because of a pre-existing condition or a patient is already on a certain drug for other reasons and there'd be a drug interaction. Um, and so, um, you know, I go at least, well, I, I try at least two of the first line drugs. And why do I do that? Because if we go to Botox, almost all the drug plans will say, you have to have tried and failed at least two of the first line drugs. Um, some of them even say three, three drugs. And um, in our system here in Ontario, for patients who are on um, the government plans where we can apply for Botox, they will require that you've tried and failed at least three of the, of the first line drugs. So they're there are more stringent. So that sort of guides me to, to a certain extent. Um, and then also patients uh, sometimes uh, will, you know, we, we, we just, it's a, it's a mutual kind of discussion about, you know, where do you want to go from here? Um, you know, some people are leery of injections and so they don't want to go down that route. Some people, they, they actually are sent to me and they say they want to try Botox and they haven't tried anything. So then I have to also discuss that. Um, I'm going to be frank in my practice uh, when I've sort of exhausted those, all of those things, including Botox. Uh, well, I'm starting to use some of those um, CGRP drugs, but um, th those are patients that I'm pretty sure they had migraine before they hit their head. So um you know, they're newer drugs, they're pretty well tolerated, but, you know, we have to sort of be um, 
justified in saying there's a diagnosis of migraine in here. <laughs> um, and then after that, it's um, it's a real challenge. Uh, I, you know, I, before, before we had the CGRPs, I mean, after Botox, that was it. I, that was all I had to offer. So in terms of medications, so okay. I don't like to give up, but sometimes <laughs> we've done everything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. Would other ARB drugs be helpful for headache besides candesartan? Hmm. You know, not to my knowledge. I mean, there's evidence for candesartan. I don't think the other ones have evidence behind them. So actual evidence means there's been studies that show that it works. Um, so in general, I, I like I'll sometimes have a patient who's on some kind of uh, high blood pressure pill, including things like telmosartan, which is the cousin of candesartan. And they say, well, let's switch you to candesartan and see if that works. Um, yeah, so generally we don't have the other ones with as much um, evidence behind them. Okay, great. Colleen is asking, do you recommend uh, vitamin B2 and magnesium, even if you don't, it sounds like if you don't have concussion headache, but you have frequent headaches, would you recommend to someone to be supplementing with those things? Would that help? You, so I'm understanding it's patients who, uh, somebody who doesn't really have concussion, they just have Maybe a headache just have problem. Frequent headache, yes. Yeah, I do all the time. And some patients uh, often would like to try that first instead of going to a prescription drug. So we do that. And, um, you know, some people respond. I'm not going to say everybody, but some patients actually uh, find them beneficial. And, and then we, we stop there because if their headaches reduce enough and they're satisfied, and then that's what we do. Okay, excellent. Can I differentiate whether my headaches are from the neck by the type of headache? or how or where it hurts in my head? Oh, great question. Um, you know what? Migraine has neck pain, very commonly associated with it. And so when people, we have a lot of patients who feel their neck is a separate issue from their head, but I see it often as a continuum of their headache. And a lot of patients, an early sign that they're getting a headache is they get neck pain. And that's a prodromal symptom. Prodrome means the early symptoms that are warning, you know, it's coming. And so we see it as a continuum. And it actually, if you, if we actually look at the anatomy of what, you know, which nerves are operative in producing headache, it's the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve actually has, I'm going to call them projections, but it, it actually has some um, projections into the upper cervical spinal cord. And so this makes perfect sense that you would have pain in your neck in association with the, with the headaches. And so we, we actually, a lot of us in the, you know, headache neurology, we're going to say, this is part of your problem. It's not a separate issue. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question in the community setting, what is the most common mechanism of injury for post-concussion headache that you have encountered? So for example, motor vehicle accidents, sports oh. injuries. Um, I'm going to say, you know, motor vehicle accidents and some, sometimes they're, they're almost like they're fender benders. They're not like really serious accidents that seem to be quite common. Um, I mean, I, I get all comers. A lot of people are referred through the concussion clinic at Toronto Western. Um, and so there's sports injuries in there. There's the car accidents with many of them being these sort of not terrible accidents, uh, more fender benders. And then there's the slip and falls and things like that. But I think the MVAs, the motor vehicle accidents are probably up the most common. Okay, great. Is the need to classify the headache as a migraine to use Botox more for insurance purposes or does research experience show that it's less effective if it's not actually a migraine? Yeah, there's no research to support its use. 
outside of that. That's the thing. And um, not sure how much that has been pursued. I mean, they certainly put a lot of effort into looking at migraine and Botox. I mean, it took them about 15 years to come up with the current protocol that that we have right now, and which it's a subset of migraine too. It's not, you know, episodic migraine, which means headaches less than 15 days a month. It's the chronic migraine group that they felt benefited and the others know. Um, so then when we get into other headache types, um, we don't have any evidence to support its use, which is why the insurance doesn't pay for it because they said it's not been shown to be, it's not labeled for that use because there's no research backing it up. Um, and sometimes they'll do a study and it doesn't work. So it doesn't, it's not going to get approved for use in that, you know, context, mm -hmm. okay. like other non, you know, non, non migraine headache, whether it's, you know, post concussion or, um, tension headache or whatever. Great. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the cognitive side effects of topiramate. Can you elaborate on those side effects? Yeah, good question. Um, it's typically word finding difficulties. And uh, so that's what's in the product monograph and, uh, you know, adverse events. Um, what I've had patients also tell me is that they're not as sharp mentally. And, um, you know, I'll have a, an example of a person who was a, you know, a young, a young woman uh, with a a small family and she said oh i'm really acting weird on this stuff because um you know her she had to leave money for somebody at her house to her housekeeper or something and um she said i totally forgot and she was at work and suddenly she panicked because this person was supposed to have their money and she said how could i forget she says this is this drug this is making me <laughs> very forgetful so that's the kind of thing that happens with topiramate, but word finding difficulty is like the official thing. Okay, great. Thank you. For the non-prescription supplements, is the recommendation to be taking all three? So the riboflavin, magnesium and coenzyme Q or just one of the three? We usually say take all three. Um, it's a lot of pills. So for some people, that's a problem. Um, but it, typically we say take all three. Are they synergistic? I don't think so. I think they're sort of, they, they stand alone and do whatever their mechanism is. And it's, you know, these were chosen based on theoretical reasons why they might work in headache. Um, uh, whether those reasons, those theoretical reasons are true, I don't think anybody can really prove that. It's really hard in the human being to really know are you you know are you impacting uh like this is at the uh a very basic biological level that these these might work and uh that's really hard to prove so but um they empirically work like uh meaning they tested them in patients and they said you know does it reduce your headache and they found that a certain percentage of people responded so that's how these recommendations came about great thank you it was mentioned that aerobic exercise uh, that increases oxygen to the brain would be most helpful. Would breathing exercises help as well? Great question. Um, you know, exercise probably has another very important mechanism of why it works for, for brain health and in this context. Um, so it's not just extra, it's not just oxygen. Um, and in fact, Aerobic exercises increases something called brain-derived nerve growth factor. Now that's very exciting because we used to say, oh, you know, you only have so many brain cells and you hit, I don't know, age 18 or 20, and it's all downhill after that because your brain cells start, start dying and with age, you're going to have less viable brain cells, which is why we kind of shrivel up and <laughs> but it turns out that human brains actually with age don't necessarily do that and there can be regrowth and new brain cells made and actually aerobic exercise increases this substance in the brain called brain derived nerve growth factor which actually uh, you know um kind of um allows new brain cells to be born. <laughs> so that's one of its benefits. So if you've got 
brain damage, okay, we'll say, um, that's good. New brain cells repairing the brain. So I don't think breathing, breathing exercises are enough. The breathing exercises might be good for stress management. For sure. Uh, next question. What are cervicogenic headaches and are migraine treatments effective for these types of headaches? Oh boy, that's a what that's a really good question. <laughs> Cervicogenic headaches are headaches that are said to arise from problems in the neck, I guess pathology disease in the neck. Um, I personally think it's a very rare headache type in practice. And there is a definition in the international classification of headache disorders of cervicogenic headache. But the average patient who shows up in our offices with headache and neck pain, migraine is number one. Um, I guess cervicogenic headache uh, would not be treated with migraine treatments. Um, it might be nerve blocks and things like that. But having said that, I, in my, my, uh, impression is that cervicogenic headache are actually truly rare and uh, a little bit overdiagnosed. <laughs> and um, I would I would so always sort of try to see is is there a migraine angle to this? And there often is. <laughs> okay. Great, thank you. Next one. Uh, I'm currently prescribed four of the medications that you've mentioned, gabapentin, duloxetine, ibersartan, and emivig. I have a neurologist and a GP pre prescribing these for different reasons. Is there a better way to manage these? Oh, well, let's, uh, that's actually difficult to, to discuss because I don't know you. I don't know all the reasons why this has, uh, you know, turned into your treatment regimen. Um, and uh, no, it's, I, I really can't comment. That, that would require a consultation. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, our next question is, headaches increase when uh, looking at the computer. Why is that? And is there anything that can be done to prevent this? Very common uh, complaint and comment by patients. Um, well, one, one issue is that screens are bright. And if you have headache and light sensitivity, screens are hard to, to tolerate, right? Uh, the other thing is sometimes, you know, people will be bothered by scrolling and some of the other visual stimuli that, that are occurring besides the, the light sensitivity uh, with, with uh, screens. Um, I guess the other thing is that, you know, sitting for periods of time, concentrating, staring in one place is, is also problematic. Um, and so are there easy solutions? Well, you know, people will have things like they'll put some kind of filter on their screen. I mean, to me, these are not getting at the problem, which is that your brain is overly sensitive to this kind of stimuli, because this is what's happened. I mean, um, these are kind of like normal things that are in our everyday lives. And it's just that your brain is hypersensitive to light and other external stimuli. Um, so, I mean, sure, put a filter on your screen. Uh, some patients have, uh, you know, obtained special lenses uh, with blue filters and things like this. And I, I'm not going to say I'm an expert in that kind of uh, stuff. I'm not. Uh, often optometrists will come up with these things with the with the glasses, for instance. And sometimes they're kind of pricey. So I'm, I'm just cautious about, you know, patients buying things that are, you know, a bit expensive. And, you know, maybe if, if they have limited financial resources, I caution them about that. Um, but, you know, when I have that kind of complaint, I really want to try to make your brain more resilient, able to tolerate these things that are part of our, you know, day-to-day -day life now. Yeah, great. Thank you. The, our next question, can you say more about abdominal migraines, please? Can they also <laughs> be triggered by a concussion uh, if migraines were, were triggered? 
IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, is through the roof since the head injury and the gastroenterologist is at a loss. Endoscopy to no avail. Wow. You Great question. That or not. So guess what? Irritable bowel syndrome is a really common comorbidity in our migraine population. Um, so when I hear that, I mean, I'm, I think it's part of this constellation of, you know, headache disorder and irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and the abdominal migraine, well, it's interesting. It's, it's, you know, it's sort of been considered, well, that's a pediatric disorder. And I guess you grow out of it. Um, I do adult neurology. And so I don't see abdominal migraine usually, but I ask about it historically when I assess patients with headache. Um, I've always had this feeling about irritable bowel syndrome. Now, my colleagues who do headache, they'll say irritable bowel syndrome is really common in our, in our you know, migraine population. So that's not news to the greater world. But I always wondered, is this maybe a symptom that, that's actually part of the migraine? I mean, migraine has a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea and vomiting, right? So then the irritable bowel syndrome is just, just sort of a little bit more of, you know, that gut, uh, you know, involvement in this condition um, because there's a lot of nerve cells in your gut. And so uh, there's actually one neurologist once who I was at a panel listening to me, he says, well, everybody knows uh, um, irritable bowel syndrome is just abdominal migraine of adults. <laughs> And so uh, the gastroenterologists, I'm not sure, kind of un know about this sort of migraine and headache connection with irritable bowel, because I often just hear them looking at it as an isolated thing. But I actually see it more of a, it, you, you, you connect the dots with it, with migraine. And maybe, you know, you know, you may, did you have migraine, you have a migraine tendency before you hit your head. And now, you know, the other associated disorders that you have, like irritable bowel, worsened with the concussion. So I guess that's the way I would put it together. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I just noted in the chat, Catherine has just, uh, she said a doctor at UHN recommended F.Lux app, that's an app, uh, for the light in the computer or cell phone, and she's found it very helpful. Oh, just oh good. FYI for all of those that might be looking for something. Uh, okay, next question. What do you think about Botox injections? My neurologist has suggested. Well, personally, I think Botox is a very useful um, uh, treatment in in uh, the treatment of headaches. I, uh, I mean, I, I think it's been, a, I started uh, giving Botox um, eight years ago, and I think it's a terrific additional tool for some patients, not for everybody, obviously, but, um, and it's extremely safe. So, you know, we have patients who can't take certain drugs because of their cardiac disease or, um, you know, et cetera. Botox is so well tolerated, so safe, and it has a long history, a very long history, more than 30 years of safety profile, not in headache, because this is sort of, it was approved for use in Canada in 2011, and one year before that in the US, but um, we've used Botox for all sorts of other medical conditions. Most of them, well, many of them are neurological. So we have a long you know, track record of use of Botox with really good, um, good results, but also uh, excellent tolerability and safety profile. Great, thank you. Uh, at three months post-concussion, I am beginning vestibular therapy for dizziness. Could this also help with my headaches? Um, I'm going to say probably not because that's a set like, you know, this dizziness and vestibular problems with concussion. It's really quite common. You're right. But it, it, it doesn't really um, help the headaches, I don't think. OK, thank you. OK, I'm just conscious of the time. I want to try and squeeze it as many as we can here. Someone is asking, can your head pain actually be referred from the neck? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, 
Deborah is asking, I don't think we can probably do this in the time allotted, but she, she was asking to see the slide that discriminated between migraine symptoms versus tension headache. Are you able to just comment on? Yeah, I can quickly comment. I mean, um, you know, migraine, throbbing, often one-sided, it doesn't rule it out if, it, if it's on both sides that it's migraine, but throbbing nature at times, it doesn't have to be always throbbing. Um, uh, moderate to severe intensity um, and, you know, nausea, vomiting, light and noise sensitivity. So tension is, while well, they say both sides of the head, not throbbing, no other associated symptoms like nausea, vomiting, light and noise sensitivity. Activity. And it can be of mild, mild severity, but migraine typically, you're not saying, oh, I have a little migraine, you know, when it, when it escalates, it's, it's at least medium, if not more, you know, high intensity. Okay, that's great. Okay, I'm just going to squeeze another one or two in. Anna is asking, I have taken gabapentin 300 milligrams BID plus 600 milligrams at night for a while. The headaches have been improving. When can I lower the dose? when do headaches go away after the concussion or will I be <laughs> dealing with these for the rest of my life? Oh boy. Well, that, that's highly variable, but when can you sort of back off on gabapentin? I mean, I usually say, look, let's, let's get you like improved. And that may take a few months. Like I always say, give it a minimum three months at your target dose. And then I don't want to change anything if we've gotten some improvement because if we, if we start backing off when you just attain some improvement, you might just relapse. So you want to have a period, I call it, get you into remission and then maintenance. I call it maintenance. So at least, you know, oh, at least six months of maintenance. I mean, many patients need longer than that. And I've learned that over my career because I backed off too quickly and then we were just back at square one. So uh, maybe, uh, you know, a nice, good, solid several months of maintenance. If you're really keen to get off, well, then a very cautious withdrawal of the drug. So, you know, you're on, um, it sounds like about 1200 milligram, you know, you might want to reduce only by 300 milligram monthly or something like that, or sometimes even slower to see if you can tolerate withdrawing it. Now, can headaches eventually go away? Yes, they can. I mean, with time, you know, they can. It's not that I, I would say everyone's doomed to have this for the rest of their life. No, but uh, sometimes it could take a while <laughs> and it can be a few years. Um, it's highly variable though. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And one, this is the last one. So in terms of the non-prescription supplements that you recommended, uh, are they to be taken with or without food? And also this individual is asking, can they be taken with other medications or vitamins? Are there any contraindications? Right. Okay. So with or without food, um, I think you can do either. I don't see a problem with any of these supplements. Um, you know, I, I suppose if somebody felt that something upset their stomach, then they could take it with food, but um, it, I think it could be either way. Um, the other thing is, is there any contraindications with certain medications? No prescription drugs that I can think of. Um, then the other thing is you look at your other supplements. Sometimes, you know, your multivitamin also has some vitamin B2 and magnesium, usually not that much magnesium, but the B2, there might be substantial amount or B complex also has a little bit of, you know, B2. So you don't want to uh, I would say, I, I say, well, if you're already on a B complex, you know, take 300 milligrams, say of, of the pure B2. Um, and, and so you want to look at what's in all your supplements to see that, you know, are you duplicating stuff? Because you don't want to necessarily take, a, you know, more, you just sort of like try to get in the, that sort of uh, amount that I've got there and uh, that I've, I've mentioned. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Slager. That was an excellent talk. And we just had so many great questions tonight. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, but thank you again for, for joining us. And thank you to everyone uh, for attending. Just as a reminder, we will be sending you uh, a very short survey, uh, which Christian has just put into the, um, into the chat. Uh, that'll also be coming to you via email. So if you have any suggestions for future sessions, please let us know. 
Uh, so this is our last session of 2022. We're going to be off for about a month and resuming on Tuesday, January the 10th at 6 p.m. And uh, that um, talk will feature Dr. Eric Massacott, and he's going to be speaking on whiplash. Uh, so our updated flyer should, uh, should be out soon. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I hope everyone has a great holiday. And thanks again, Dr. Slager, for joining us. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.